Tell us when we're ready to go. We're live. Okay, great. Welcome back to the Senate Education, uh, Friday, March 11th, 2.45. Mr. Secretary, welcome. You're uh, the last uh, <laughs> item on our agenda. Uh, we really appreciate you making the time this last day of crossover, on uh, the day of crossover, to give us a little bit of an update on what you're seeing in schools and uh, what your the numbers are looking like, what you anticipate going forward, et cetera. So with that, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, good afternoon, yeah, Dan French, Secretary of Education. It's uh, good to see you in your natural environment, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like a National Geographic study. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, pleased to provide an update on COVID, um, and I can do that. I also sent over a handout just on ESSER, which I'll, I'll kind of just uh, okay. remind you a little bit about that conversation. Uh, yeah, I know it's fair to say, um, you know, the trends are certainly positive. I think you're well aware. Uh, we would call this a moment of transition. Yet again, we've had several of these, whether they're good or for bad. Um, but this is, you know, this is a moment of transition for the system as we move from sort of one set of mitigation recommendations to another. And regardless of whether the transitions are positive or negative, they're always transitions and they do require um, a lot of work. And there's there's things that we're seeking to, uh, you know, answer and clarify for people as they make make that change. It is it's very interesting. If we weren't living this, it would be very interesting just to consider uh, the rapidity at which Omicron has uh, made an impact on not only our society, but our education system. You know, we, I can remember uh, it was at Thanksgiving um, when we first heard about Omicron. And uh, I do these weekly calls with the superintendents and uh, just to kind of foreshadow for them what we're seeing, what we're thinking and how we're planning for it. And I can remember sometime around maybe the first week of December, it must have been right after Thanksgiving, we identified sort of three sort of descriptors, if you will, of a variant, uh, you know, to what extent is it more contagious? To what extent does it cause more disease? And then third, to what extent uh, does it evade the vaccines that we have? And we didn't really know. So we knew about Omicron and then we started to learn more as we watched what was happening in South Africa and then the UK. That seems to, the vaccines are holding up. It definitely seems more contagious, but we're not sure to what extent it promotes more disease or not more severe illness. And then bam, it was here. You know, it was like we came back after the the Christmas holiday and and you know, it was it was one of the more challenging moments of the pandemic ever that we've had. And mm -hmm. um, you know, and now it's gone. It's going quickly. Um, it's amazing. You know, we knew the trajectory that was I mean, we could witness in other parts of the world. Um, and that's exactly what's happening. You know, it's 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 uh, phasing out, if you will. And even uh, recently before, you know, most of our schools run winter vacation, um, that third week of February, uh, when we made the announcement that we were going to enable the 80% masking rule the week before, you know, our, our interest was going into the holiday with some sense of stability and we didn't want people worried about it. And, you know, we wanted to tell them up front here, you know, here's what we're going to do after the holiday. Don't worry about anything during the holiday. We won't talk about any new guidance or anything like that. We're just telling you now. And, you know, there was mixed, mixed uh, reception to that message. You know, some people were fearful and we went into the holiday. And then we came back like immediately from vacation. Everyone was like, when are we going to be able to take off our masks? So something happened over the holiday period and people's perception of where things were going. Um, so there was much more interest uh, in moving towards an endemic disposition in schools. I think after vacation, perhaps it was, you know, the cases are keep coming down and what for, and people were traveling perhaps over the holiday and going out to other parts of the country. And um, so we've, we've enacted, I think you're aware, uh, new mitigation recommendations. And basically um, a key theme of that is there are no longer going to be separate mitigation recommendations for schools. So part of our goal was to move schools away for the need to have specific mitigation recommendations, because essentially now the vaccine's widely available, there's no need for schools to have separate protections than the broader society. But we were not ready to go live with uh, that next sort of turn of the spigot, if you will, for broader society. Um, yeah, so we waited and set the date for March 14th, which is Monday. So on Monday, we'll be operating under the new mitigation recommendations for all Vermonters. Um, schools will be living under those. And um, that that's the work that's in transition right now. We saw several school districts, I don't have an exact number, maybe around a dozen, maybe not quite that high, 
who elected to sort of go to mass optional uh, prior. You know, some some went live this week on the seventh. That was a so seemed to be a popular date for some of the early adopters, if you will. Um, and the issue of mask is sort of like the uh, I would say the representation of the new mitigation recommendations. But there's other aspects. Um, another key aspect of this, because you know we've maintained a pretty significant testing program in the state in schools. You know we call test at home. You might remember test at stay, then test at home or surveillance testing. Um, so we're maintaining those testing programs for the time being, um, particularly the staff assurance testing and uh, test at home will, will remain in place at least through the end of March. Uh, but that'll be sort of the next piece as we transition away from a discrete uh, testing strategy in school in favor of a uh, schools living under the broader testing strategy that's uh, going to be available in the state. When I say will be available in the state, because we're making some changes in that testing strategy at the state level as well, we're moving away uh, from sort of the state-run PCR-based testing centers that you're probably familiar with. Those centers will remain operational, but they'll more become uh, distribution centers of antigen tests as opposed to uh, PCR uh, testing sites. Uh, so you'll be able to pull into those sites and get antigen tests as the federal supply increases. And that, that transition will happen somewhere around the beginning of April. And then probably by May, we'll be shutting down those sites altogether in favor of folks just getting their antigen tests at pharmacies or retail outlets and so forth, because the the supply is in, increasing significantly even as we speak from the federal government. So um, all good news in terms of uh, COVID mitigation, um, and that that allows us to create more capacity to start making a pivot into the recovery work. Uh, which is one of the reasons I wanted to highlight the ESSER funding uh, handout, the one pager I put into my. Uh, I'm passing that. I'm passing that out right now. Yeah. So just as a reminder, a uh, little bit, we, um, you know, we worked hard with you last year to align, um, you know, particularly this this last tranche of federal funding. ESSER program, I'm sure you're aware, is the Elementary Secondary Education Emergency Relief Fund. It's the primary source of funding for COVID relief in schools. There's been three versions of this, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, um, because sometimes things don't make sense in bureaucracy. There is no ESSER 3. There's ARP ESSER, which essentially is would be the equivalent of ESSER 3. ARP ESSER is the big pot of money. Uh, basically, in each tranche of funding that I just described, you know, ESSER 1 began at the beginning of the pandemic. Vermont got about $30 million. ESSER 2 went up to 120 some odd million dollars. And uh, ARP ESSER is like $280 million. Um, ESSER 1 and 2 are pretty much out the door. So now we're working on ARP ESSER, ESSER 3. Uh, and that came out last spring. That's what necessitated the state ARP ESSER plan. As you might remember, we met over the summer and had the committee take a look at the state plan. So there's a requirement for a state plan. Um, and that was approved by the federal government. Now districts have to do their planning and so forth. At any rate, um, I just want to leave you that little piece today that there is a um, there's some money that still needs to be appropriated. And that's the budget recommendation section of that handout. There's basically eight million dollars of the state ARP ESSER plan. When I say the state funds, you know, the state, uh, the SEA, the AG, Agency of Education can reserve up to 10 percent of the funding under ESSER. And we have done that. And the 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 chunk that hasn't been appropriated yet is eight point one million. However, mm -hmm. um, there are requirements for those appropriations in the federal law. So we have to spend a certain percentage of our money on evidence-based summer programs, a certain percentage of our money on after school, uh, and a certain percent of our funding on learning loss. So that's what's listed there first, those required appropriations. So we need, we need appropriations for 2.8, 2.8, $1.3 <laughs> million dollars to meet the federal requirements. That does leave $1.1 million that is essentially discretionary in terms of not being confined by any regulation for the federal government or by any programs we've already established. Our recommendation there is to invest in a uh, facilities planning grant program. That's an outgrowth of our work under Act 72 with school districts um, through our NORMAC kind and our work doing school facilities management uh, improvement program we've identified this need to help districts plan better uh, for some of the work we're engaged in. So that would be our recommendation there. I shared this handout with the House Education Committee yeah. yesterday. So this is kind of just hitting, coming out now, um, but happy to talk about this in more detail. And that's pretty much my testimony. I'd be happy to talk about COVID or ESSER or any of those issues. Yeah, the, where it says required appropriations, 
are those the actual federal recommended? Uh, did the feds actually recommend those exact dollars, or is that something that you sort of worked within some guidelines and came up? It's with? a percentage of our. You know, we have to spend X number percent of our dollars on these these activities. I will say with ARPESER, um, the locals also have required percentages as well. So, for example, uh, and you might be familiar with ESSER, 90% of the funding goes to districts. We call it LEAs. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. For instance, they have to spend 20% of their uh, ARPESER money on learning loss, evidence-based learning loss activities. doesn't prescribe the specific approach, but they have to be in that qualified spending channel, if you will. And that's what these appropriations here, these are spending channels. Um, and we are, the good news is we already have these channels established. You've made appropriations in these buckets before or channels, yeah. and we just need to appropriate the additional funds. We have a question from Senator Caranzini. Uh Secretary French, I, I think I'm just uh, thinking out loud, but you know, we, we talked yesterday more about testing for uh, PFOAs in school. Could that money be used to ramp up that program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's a great question. The starting point for any of the funding, whether it be state and local, is COVID. So it's important to think about, you know, first, it has to kind of meet that test. It has to be COVID related. Now, there are uh, areas, particularly with indoor air quality, that become an opportunity where these sort of other issues can be addressed, but we have to sort of thread that needle. So to the extent that it would satisfy um, you know, that sort of test of being COVID related, yes, these funds can be spent on areas that, you know, might be directly targeted to PCBs or PFOAs, you know, but they sort of have to meet that sort of indoor air quality piece. I think that's what we're finding relative to uh, being a qualified COVID expense, because that's what they have in common. Secretary French, I know there was a second, maybe it was even the third tranche of funding for the indoor air quality. Was that is that in this memo or that was not in here because that was prior or that was ARPA money or something? Yeah, I mean, we there's a whole bunch of, you know, we could give you a refresher. That's sort of my last blurb on this. You know, we should come and talk to you about the different programs that have already been established. That's not what this memo is designed to do. Yeah. This is okay. just alerting you sort of mechanically to the, the appropriations we need to meet the federal regulations that weren't addressed last year. Um, there is there is a good news. There's a $1.1 million essential discretionary uh, piece there. Uh, but the others, I would argue, are more or less mechanical. Okay. But we can, we're happy to come back and talk about all the other programs and sort of map those out for you. There's a lot of spending activity. Uh, some of it, you know, fell under the CRF funding, but uh, there's a lot under the other two uh, ESSER appropriations. And we worked with JFO last year to, because they have different timelines, you know, ARP ESSER, this last pot of money goes out to 2024. The other ESSERs we want to encumber and have those appropriations set up because they expired sooner rather than later. So we tended to shift last year, for example, we shifted a lot of summer school and after school into ESSER two, so we could mop those funds up and make sure they got used first. But there is an additional, we're, we're not spending quite enough on after school and summer. So we have these additional appropriations to meet the federal threshold. Okay. Thank you. Senator Lyons. So has the ESSER, uh... Three million for remote learning been uh, appropriated, or yet is it be has it been categorized yet? Not yet. Um, we're we're planning to do that now. So that would be you know we're happy to come back and provide an update on the different appropriations. Uh, honestly, I think we would have done that by now if it wasn't for Delta and Omicron. Um, you know, so a lot of the work we were planning for recovery all got put on hold. Um, but we are we are in the conversation of uh, with working with Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative now to expend those funds. So I'm uh, just curious: is that does that include uh, capital expenditures, hardware, software, or is it? Um, That's not. It's not what we're contemplating it, now. We're contemplating okay. remote learning programming. Yeah. Okay. We haven't, we haven't really, beyond you know, the initial uh, start of the pandemic, there wasn't a lot of demand for hardware. Um, you know, when we shut down the entire school system overnight, that's when we really panicked and everyone had to find hardware. Um, that hasn't been the case. Um, you know, I haven't seen that, that concern. And again, districts have a lot of money locally. But no, we're, we're more concerned with building capacity on remote learning uh, to um, particularly as we think about recovery and, and um, supporting students making up sort of academic progress. 
um, remote yes. learning can be very useful, particularly for the high school students who don't have access to courses and so forth to stay on track. So we want to continue to invest in our uh, Vermont virtual learning cooperative capacity to continue to expand remote learning options across the state. Thank you. Secretary Crunch, where is the recovery plan? What's the status of that? Is that still being worked on? The uh, state plan? State plan. Yeah, it was approved by the federal government in December. No, I'm sorry, I need to correct. You're doing a learning loss oh, recovery. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, that's yeah. About. Yeah, that's, that's really coming out now. I mean, we're, uh, okay. we worked on it, you know, twice now. <laughs> and, um, you know, COVID outsmarted us both times. And, uh, you know, just to reflect on that, we, in that first year uh, after school opened and we were heading into Halloween, we thought we were moving into recovery. You know, sure, sure. and uh, you know, we 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 have to retain a sense of humility in front of the virus. But we are, um, and you've heard some of the testimony, particularly on mental health and so forth. I know Secretary Deputy Secretary Boucher has been in. Um, we are now basically shutting down a lot of our uh, mitigation planning structures inside of state government in favor of creating new planning structures around recovery. So we're we have to let go of one in order to do the other, and that's that's happening as we speak. Senator Hooker. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Friend. Uh, with your mitigation um, implementation, and I know it's sort of early still, I mean, things are happening quickly and, and things are changing. Have you seen a change in um, attendance of both kids and staff? And, you know, how are the, how is our staff members um, being able to cope with what's going on. I know we talked about helping out, you know, having money appropriated to make sure that staff is taken care of. And I'm just curious to know what kind of difference you're seeing now um, that the virus is coming yeah, I, down. Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's fair to, I mean, as you can imagine, it's, it's always hard to make general statements about our education system, but it's, it's, it runs the gamut. Um, you know, and it's fair to say we, in for a large part of the state, has not enacted the new requirements yet or the new recommendations, not requirements. And um, so that's playing out. And people are, I would say, like, any, again, any transition moment we've experienced, people are acclimating themselves to that. I will say um, I had, uh, I meet twice, twice a month with the leadership of the School Nurses Association. And I had that meeting yesterday. Um, and, you know, part of my, my questioning to them is always like, how's it going? And um, I should say, firstly, they're in a much better place than they were in January. I mean, as a, as a group of employees, they were really struggling. Um, but they talked quite a bit when we, we started to, you know, talk about how people were acclimating. The conversation really broke down into two groups. How are students doing? Then how are staff doing? Um, by far and away, staff, students are doing well. I mean, they, they uh, and I didn't provoke the conversation the several nurses unsolicited observed we're so proud of our students they're being really respectful of each other you know many are anxious to take their masks off but they're they're okay with people who might be wearing a mask for some other reason so they the kids get it i think the staff are probably you know having a more difficult time making the transition the nurses talked a bit about um parents for example um uh, asking nurses to enforce masking policy you know for example a parent would call a nurse and say, uh, I want you to make sure my child is wearing his mask like I told him to when he left the house this morning, you know, or I want you to make sure my child is, is got six feet around them in the lunchroom. So we have that aspect, which always puts school staff in the middle, which is why staff are more stressed out on these things perhaps than the students are. Um, but the nurses also remarked on spending, you know, because nurses are go-to people for staff as well. And you know, school staff look to nurses to interpret our health guidance and so forth. Um, some of the nurses remarked on spending quite a bit of time with individual staff members on their own concerns and so forth. So I think all those things are happening as we speak and, and we'll work through that. Um, what I offered is to provide, you know, communication, direction, whatever I could to help, you know, be respectful of this transition moment. At the same time, I also want to keep people moving forward. I think it's critical at this point that we do really move towards a endemic disposition in schools. I'd, I've seen some schools saying, well, we'll take, we'll take our time, we'll take four months just to be sure 
I think that really does a disservice uh, in, in is really not helpful uh, to actually moving into recovery. Um, so we've, we've got to make progress and it is hard if we're, if we can't get out of the mitigation business, then it's going to be hard to engage in the recovery business inside of schools as well as the state level. If it's safe to do that, we need to do it with a sense of urgency. Yeah. Other questions, Secretary French? <clears throat> Secretary French, anything else for us at this point? Uh, no, thank you for your partnership. Uh, look forward to seeing you on the other side. Um, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're, we're putting a lot of, ramping up a lot of effort on uh, recovery planning, um, also uh, the waiting study uh, and so forth. You know, there's complex policy issues that we want to be able to support mm -hmm. your work. Senator Persley. And uh, I, I was thinking the other side is crossover, but that's only two days of what, whatever, <laughs> four days away. Uh, I'm hoping that we just just to put it on the agenda so to speak on the on the facilities inventory work and hopefully pick that back up from where we left it last year looking forward to that and, yeah. and maybe combining it with the pcb yeah we're there's a lot of uh, i would say synergies happening around pcbs and the other facilities work um that's that's good news from my perspective talking with uh, commissioner walk this morning and again with the superintendents this afternoon that's good. It needs to be integrated into the larger scope of work. Um, inventory had some uh, interchange or interaction with on that topic this morning. We have about five districts that still haven't completed their inventory. So we, as of the 15th, I'm going to be reaching out to them directly uh, to encourage them to complete that inventory. So we will have reporting. The vendors will have that reporting done by the end of March. So we want to get those stragglers in. It'll just add, make it a more complete uh, report. And notably, a couple of the districts that hadn't completed it are also embarking on significant facilities renovations right now. So it's really important that we get them included. Yeah. Okay. Senator Chittenden. So I don't know if this would be Secretary French, but I, as we start talking about building constructions, testing PFOAs and all that, um, I would love to better understand why there was a referendum or what is a moratorium, moratorium on school funding back in 2007, 2008. So the treasurer spoke to that a couple of times. I'd like to understand what it would mean to lift that moratorium and what the benefits that could be looking at the next five, 10 years for all, all of our school districts that need uh, new school upgrades to their school facilities. Yeah, and that's really Act 72, um, you know, is, is situating us uh, to start to embark on that, that work, um, the inventory, uh, the assessment, which is in Act 72, and then starting to work on the policy and regulations that define school construction that were um, not haven't been updated in many, many years. And then uh, adding capacity to the agency. The agency used to have three full-time staff administering that program. We have zero right now. Um, so, you know, all those things need to come together. And then the bottom line is at some point we need to figure out how to pay for it all. Um, and then, you know, I would just, why, why you've uh, put this on the table, I'll just also uh, from a policy perspective remark, we can't afford from my perspective to do an across the board flat reimbursement for all schools. We're going to have to have that conversation about which schools we invest in. And because the big thing that's happened since 2007 is our population schools has declined significantly. So that's, that's going to be a, a more challenging policy conversation, but I think one that should be brought, brought forward at the same time. Okay. Yeah. So Secretary French, it's uh, really appreciate it. Really appreciate all the work that you and your your team have already provided us this year. You've been a huge help, as I mentioned to you in the fall a couple of days ago with a number of our bills. So thank you. And we look forward to continuing the conversation, probably starting next week on everything we're receiving from the House and the additional work that we're going to do on our end. So thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you can take this offline.